Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Dr. Rhonda Lowe, welcome. Thank you very much. Pleased to be here. We're living in very interesting times as far as our ability to age. Not only uh, the time in human history, mm -hmm. but also where we live on the west coast of British Columbia or of Canada actually, how well are we doing at staying alive, staying alive longer, and staying alive well? Oh, we're doing really well. Because if you compare us to where we are now for how much older we are and how much longer we're living, compared to 100 years ago, the average lifespan of a woman was age 60. The average lifespan... 100 years ago. 100 years ago, 1920, yeah. about that time period. So, 60? Gee, 58 for a man at that time. Now we're moving forward at least. If you're 65 years old right now, you have a chance of living 20 more years from to, to age 85. 65 to 85. And on the West Coast, we're certainly, we certainly have the highest or longest longevity that we have compared to the rest of Canada. So let's say I live the next five years. I'm 65 now and I live another five years. Do my odds of living even longer go up because I've made it through the next five years and there are exciting advancements, advances coming along? Well, it, it depends how you're going to live those oh, years. Oh, yes. So, that of part. course, yeah. it's your part that you yeah. have to put into this. So we know a small proportion of longevity is due to your genes. You know, you've got to inherit good ones. Mm -hmm. um, but really, that's a small percentage, down around 10 to 15 percent. And then another 15 to 20, 25 percent depends upon where you live so you get health care and you're properly taken care of if, if something does happen to you. Mm -hmm. But you know the vast majority of longevity can be attributed to your own personal lifestyle habits what you do to be proactive and how you can live a better life to minimize the chance of getting all these chronic diseases. But that means that I have to take responsibility for that. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and so I can, I can tell you a few things about what you need to do to take responsibility and we can start, it's never too young to start, let's oh, put it that way. But I know that you're going to tell me, control what I put in my mouth. <laughs> well, that part. But yeah. you know, there's, there's stuff to be proactive. So for example, if you're 45 now, uh, think about, or 40 now, think about your family history. Mm -hmm. Start thinking about that. Ask questions of your family. What do they have? What are you more at risk for? What's gotten grandma and grandpa in the end? Know what that is so you know what your personal risk factors are for diabetes or heart disease, high blood pressure. And then knowing that, go and get yourself checked out. So everyone should know what their blood pressure is. They should know what their cholesterol levels is, are. They should know what their fasting blood sugars are because if your mom and dad had a I had type 2 diabetes, we know that you have a 20 to 25 percent chance of having type 2 diabetes yourself. But the good news is that you can prevent all that by lifestyle. Well, first of all, let's just go back to getting the test. Why yeah. is it so important, especially as we start to clear the half century mark, that we, that we have that baseline or that we know where we're at? It's important because you can do something about it. So, for example, if you have high blood pressure, we know that for every 10 points under 140, which is the top limit of normal, you can actually decrease your risk of stroke by 25 to 27 percent. By every 10 points? Downwards, yeah. yes. So, if you do have high blood pressure, take the bull by the horns, make some lifestyle changes, maybe you need some medication, but we know that's going to set you in good stead down the road for preventing strokes or cardiovascular disease. Well, that comes back to what you put in your mouth. Yeah, well, it can do, <laughs> and also how you live your life, a little mm -hmm. activity and such. If you have high cholesterol, again, some lifestyle measures that you can take so that you can decrease your risk of heart attack and stroke. Because for folks in their 30s to 40s, for every 10 to 20 years you have high cholesterol levels, you can double to quadruple your risk for cardiovascular disease in your 60s. In your 60s? Yes. So it's, it doesn't start just because you're clearing the, the big five zero. You really have to be conscious of this all the way through. Yes. So in a, in a world where we've seen, especially in North America, some fairly poor dietary choices by a considerable number of people over the last few decades. Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that the next generation doesn't follow that same pattern 
And then for those who maybe got a little bit off on the wrong foot, how do we help them get back into a place that will ensure that they have a better quality of life. You know, it's and that's a big thing. I mean, you hear about longevity and folks will say, sometimes I have patients say to me, well, what's the point of living longer because something's going to get you in the end. Yeah. And as you get older, all you're going to do is get sicker and become more disabled. So what's the good of extra years if they're not going to be quality years? Mm -hmm. Well, the great news about this and and the upbeat nature of that is actually a study was recently published in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society that found that for the folks who do live long lives, mm -hmm. the centenarians, the late 90s, the super old. The super centenarians. Yeah, the yeah. super centenarians. <laughs> yeah. They actually found that those folks who lived good long lives compared to uh, the folks who did, they actually have quality lives. So what gets them in the end happens in a compressed time period. Mm -hmm. So they're... So it's not like they're limping through the last three decades of life. Exactly. They actually come down with something possibly in the last few weeks or last few months of life. Mm -hmm. So they have great quality of life. But again, that depends how you live it. Now this is where we can take some major lessons from communities around the world mm -hmm. called the blue zones. The blue zones. The blue zones. What and does that mean, this is what's zone? so absolutely cool. So this was actually founded by the National Geographic Society and they did an expedition to go and search out the longest living cultures from around the world. Mm -hmm. And what was cool about that was they found communities scattered throughout the world had no relationship to each other. Okinawa being one of the most famous ones, mm -hmm. where they're longest living folks in the plant on the planet. They're centenarians by dozens. The other one was Loma Linda in California. Loma Linda, California. Yeah, well, high the proportions. Air they have there? Well, but uh, high quality of Seventh Day Adventists. Another community was mm -hmm. Sardinia, in Italy. Another one was in Icaria in Greece. Now, odd, very different communities. But when they looked at all of these communities, they found a common theme with respect to longevity. And they could intersect all these circles. I just got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. So what were those common themes? One of them was folks were physically active mm -hmm. all their lives. Now we're not talking about formal exercise. They were just busy. They were putzers. They were in their gardens. They did Tai Chi. They walked everywhere. But they didn't do some formal gym activity right. whatsoever. The other one that they did was they actually were sensible eaters. So what they did was yeah. they ate a plant-based diet, they ate whole grains, more fish-based. And what's really interesting about the Okinawans particularly is they have a saying called harahachibu. And that means eat till you're 80% full. Uh -huh. So it helps with calorie restrictions, but at the same time, it also helps keep you lean mm -hmm. and making sure that you're not overweight because we know that obesity contributes to many chronic diseases in life. Yeah. The other factor that they found was that they had a great outlook in life so they were de-stressed or they didn't let that get to them and the other most overriding feature was they had purpose. Uh -huh. So that meant they had a reason to get up every morning mm -hmm. and every one of these folks and communities in their super centenarians, their super seniors, yeah. they had that one. And then the other one was they connected with their society. So family was important. Their community was important. They hung with like-minded individuals. Mm -hmm. Faith-based, perhaps, in Loma Linda for that. Yeah. Those were all the connecting features that helped all of these communities produce long-living folks. So I was just reading an interesting article about the brain immune system connection and in at Virginia University they have just found this physical link like an actual physical link between the brain and your immune system and and so it leads me to how important is frame of mind in our overall well-being Absolutely important there you go, there's purpose. You have to have purpose in your life. If you don't have purpose, you don't have a reason to get up in the morning, well then, you know, the rest of your body just 
wonders why you need to do that and it affects your immune system. Stress, we know psychological stress decreases your immune system and makes you more vulnerable to getting colds, pneumonias, and then coupled that with as we get a bit older, our immune systems get a little fragile just mm -hmm. as it is. So mind-body connection is absolutely key to your immune system and keeping you healthy. So most of what we've been talking about so far, we've kind of known, and it, as the years go by, the evidence continues to support that. But as we're living longer, you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier, there are people who go, well, what difference does it make? My, my body is deteriorating anyways. What are some of the advances in regenerative medicine that are starting to come along that are, are you know, giving some hope? Like, right, stem cells, for example, as, as a startup. Mm -hmm. as, now, right now it's still in its infancy stage, but yeah. they're looking at these cells that can possibly turn into pluripotential cells, which are cells right. that could... Pluripotent or something, yes. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, to yeah. help it actually regenerate yeah. whatever was go has gone awry. Still in its infancy, but that's got great promise down the but road. Are, are we seeing some of that already in treatment of uh, knee uh, um, ailments and so on where they're injecting stem cells? They're looking at that, but yeah. I, still, I, I still believe that there needs to be more regulation in that industry and in fact um, a recent study has shown that many centers that are touting stem cell therapies right now may be just a little ahead of their mark hmm. as to uh, what they can promise to help folks with but I think much more on the exciting phase for medicine is the fact that we're moving towards individual treatments more on a genetic based mm -hmm. treatment for chronic disease or certain diseases. So we're now understanding that many cancers are actually genetically based diseases that are individualized. Mm -hmm. We know that breast cancer has at least 11 different genetic permutations. And as science marches on, you can help target those genetic changes to help individualized therapy for that particular individual rather than shotgun treating mm -hmm. everybody the same way. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. So you talk about individualized medicine. That we're really talking about what, what the promise of mapping the human genome was all about. Uh, does that mean that we're going to, instead of being uh, simply a reactive system, we're going to be able to anticipate and hopefully intervene rather than have to wait for conditions or symptoms to, to manifest. And, and that's the hope down the road. We're still in its infancy for that, but we can see that happening. But I can see that the other part that's helping folks most for their intervention is prevention. I see you're wearing a Fitbit. Yes, that's right. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm so, getting ready to go on a walking holiday, uh, and I want to know how far I walk, well, but not see, because I'm... <laughs> but, but how smart is that? Because 10,000 steps of physical activity a day is known to help decrease any chance of coming down with things. But, but is 10,000 enough? When we look at our diet, is 10,000 steps really enough? Well, it's a good start. Yes. Because if we compare it to other folks right now, the new mantra is, sitting is the new smoking. Yes, I've heard this a few yes. times. And you know, our 30 minutes of exercise in the gym doesn't necessarily mitigate or offset all that risk of sitting for eight to 10 hours a day. So we're talking about activity. So even our standing desks at work, that helps. But we also don't want you to be standing still for that proportion. So a good rule of thumb is don't sit for longer than 20 minutes at a time. Don't stand still for more than eight minutes at a time, but get up and walk for two minutes at least a few times an hour. It's activity that counts. That's where your steps come in, Stu. There's your 10,000 steps in your Fitbit. But you know, like, I get beaten up by the world and all I want to do is just go, oh, give me a break. You're telling me that I've got to live like a pious life, be active, 
Don't no. rest. Like, do all those things. I want it to be easy. Oh, yeah, it but, is uh, easy, though. Uh, Harahachibu, you can eat till you're 80% full. But anything. There, there's no gauge on there that I, says you're 80% full. Well, you can check that yourself. <laughs> that's that's the important one on that. There's no gauge, and it's hard to learn where you're 80% full. Yeah. But you can train yourself to that point by being a little more mindful when you eat. Mm -hmm. By the time you feel full, you've actually overeaten. It takes 20 minutes from when your stomach actually does reach full potential to your brain registers, oh, I'm full. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is you can be more mindful as you eat. And when your stomach feels a little bit full already, that's 80% full rather than your brain saying you're full. So you eat till you stop feeling hungry, mm -hmm. not till you're full. And that whole idea of cleaning your plate it's not such a good idea. Well, I was told that we were supposed mm -hmm. to because there were people who were starving around the world. Well, that's right. And so it was like, finish what's on the plate. Yeah. Uh, and I always thought, well, look at what that did to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, there's a fellow that I interviewed uh, from the Sauter School of Business, and in his PhD thesis, he was talking about why is it that the French don't get fat. Mm -hmm. And he said, because they're hedonistic eaters. Huh? Like, how does that make sense? And he said, well, you take a look at what they eat. They shouldn't be as slim as they are. He said, but because they, uh, they eat for the sensation of the food, mm -hmm. once the sensation goes away, they stop eating. Very similar yeah. to the harahachi brew. And, and, and so, I, like, it's I asked him to... pleasure. Yeah. I, I said, how does that work? And he goes, we've all had a piece of chocolate cake. And I said, yes. And he says, you know, there's that first mouthful where you're going, mm, that is good. And the second mouthful is still good. The third one, it's, a, it's almost neutral. By the fourth or fifth bite, you're not getting any extra pleasure out of it. He says, that's when the French stop e eating. Mm -hmm. But we clear the plate. Right, or we have this giant size in yeah. general, yeah. such as a glass of red wine. Wonderful to go with a meal, to go with all the folks you're having a meal with. Mm -hmm. But you don't drink the whole bottle. You yeah. have a glass of red wine. And that's one of the ones that increases longevity in some of the cultures that were looked at in the Blue Zones. It's so fascinating. I want to learn more about living longer and better, but i got to take our third break. We'll be back in a moment. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. So what's happening though, I haven't done these things and now I want to get back on track. But it's I've about always, time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'm now, I'm, I'm now suffering from high blood pressure and I've got, you know, gout or something and I'm going, okay, I don't want this, I want to turn back. Mm -hmm. what can, how can the, our medical system get me back on track? Because it's probably reached the point where me just changing my lifestyle isn't going to be enough. It'll be part of it, but what's happening from the, uh, the you yeah, know the perspective yeah. of uh, caregivers like you that you can say, okay, here's what we can do to make this better for you. I think well, first of all, you need to see your caregiver. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> that's a so, big one. and regularly. <laughs> yes, and that's that's a really important thing is how do you um, have a good relationship with your caregiver, and in in these times it's tough for people to find primary care practitioners, mm -hmm. but if you do have the ability to have one that you're associated with. It's important to get to know them and develop a relationship. So continuity of care is absolutely key so that you get a chance to know what they're like if you can work together over time because it's your health. So trying to find someone that you can work with is really important. But the other thing is in the olden days we had the medical model of the MD or one person where you go, you see them, you take notes, you go home, and then you just take your drugs and try to live mm -hmm. a better life. Now we're looking at a team approach. So for the individuals that have hypertension like you, um, we want to say- I don't have hypertension. You have high blood pressure. So, I don't. Uh, uh, or if you did. <laughs> <laughs> or you're in denial. No, no, I actually haven't got oh, yeah, the checkup. I'm fine. Okay, good. So, so that's the point if, for folks who do have that or who just want to live a better life and just improve and have great years coming up. 
we're looking at a team. So get a team together that you have a dietitian mm -hmm. on your side to have them just review your diet. And, and we all mind, mindlessly eat. Sometimes we're drinking too much coffee. Sometimes we're eating too many carbohydrates and we're not enough protein or um, too much protein and not enough carbohydrates. Just balance out your nutrients. Have someone cast eyes upon you. A team there, a team such as kinesiologists, someone who helps you develop a program of physical activity that you can stick to without having to go to the gym, lift weights, and um, do. Help them find a program that will help keep you active. Maybe a, a person that you can check in with every now and then, such as a, a, a coach or a wellness counselor, to say, hey, where's your mind frame going? Somewhere you can do some meditation with. So you need a team or a, an approach that will help guide you forward. So where do CAMPs or complementary and alternative uh, medicines come into, into this team approach? And what is the willingness of uh, MDs, uh, medical practitioners, to accept that as part of an individual's uh, own uh, daily regime or, you know, healthcare regime. Sure, and we do know that most people do take some kind of complementary or alternative medicine. Folks, some folks take uh, glucosamine sulfate for their joints and such. Um, a lot of stuff has some background to it. Some stuff does not have science behind it. But the most important about this um, is mm. that I. I would hope that the medical practitioners are now much more open to actually listening to uh, individuals who are taking these things because no, we know that at least a third of their, our patients are taking something. And we should be able to start the dialogue and ask our patients, hey, what else are you taking besides yeah. whatever we might have prescribed you? And I would encourage patients too to feel comfortable to say, I am taking this stuff, what do you think? Mm -hmm. and hoping that your practitioner can give you a good comment about it that will be rational, uh, give you the evidence, have a discussion with you, uh, and work with you in seeing if that can be incorporated into your entire health care plan. So I believe that physicians nowadays are much more open to that. In, in other words, don't be afraid to have frank conversations with your Absolutely. Uh, healthcare practitioner. Yeah, and also you know. I think healthcare practitioners should not be afraid to have frank conversations and listen to what their patients are actually saying to them so that they can come together and create the optimal plan for uh, better health. So you're living your life this way? Absolutely, I'm living my life this way, for so, the most part, yeah. I've got to say. <laughs> Do you have a target that you would like to live to? Well, my dad lived to 92. Mm -hmm. uh, my granny lived to over 100, and she was chugging along until some of these super seniors did, just compressed some yep. ill health into the last few years of her life. That's what I'm looking for. I have aunties and uncles in their 90s, and they all still get together and have a great time family-wise. So that's my target, where I want to um, live more years, but also have life in, the, in years the years I do live. Yeah, that's what I'm aiming for. I'm trying, I want to get to 100. I think that's a possible goal, Stu. That's the way to go. <laughs> and the more I talk to you and others who can help me get uh, figure out the path to get there, my odds go up. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you for being, asking me.